Hello everyone and welcome to Network Playroom. In this video we're going to look at the LSA type number one or the router LSA in detail. So router LSAs are originated by every router and this is the most fundamental LSA and it lists all of a router's links, the state and outgoing cost of each link and any known OSPF neighbors on the link. Now, all of the router's links to the area must be described in a single router LSA. And these LSAs are flooded only within the area which they are originated in. And each LSA has a flooding scope and the router LSA stays inside the area boundaries. There are other LSAs which can cross area boundaries, but we'll discuss those in another video. So before I go ahead and talk more about the router LSA, notice that I have a diagram of the router LSA itself, and then I have the same table that I showed you in my previous video, which describes the different link types. But we'll look at that in more detail in a few moments. But now let's look at how the router LSA presents the information. So we'll jump to the diagram on the screen here. And the first half of it was introduced in my previous video covering the OSPF database and the LSA header. But briefly, each LSA type has a common 20 byte header, which is this part here. So this will be the same for each LSA type, excluding these two fields, which are specific to the LSA in question. And since we're looking at the router LSA, which is type number one, this field is going to be one. And I should point out, though, that the link state ID for router LSAs is the originating router's router ID. And as I mentioned in my previous video as well, the link state ID field in the LSA header depends on the LSA type. So this field is going to be the router ID for router LSA. But next, let, let's jump to the next section, which is after the common header. So we'll look at the uh, VEB bits. So the V or virtual link endpoint bit is set to one when the originating router is an endpoint of at least one fully adjacent virtual link. So the V bit is signaled in type one LSA only if the router is the endpoint of one or more fully adjacent virtual links. And the area through which you configure the virtual link is known as a transit area. And note here that when the V bit is set, this could change the path calculation preference between intra area and intra area routes. We haven't really discussed OSPF path selection yet, but there are very specific rules that the routers must follow when choosing the best path. But there's a great document about OSPF virtual link transit capability from Cisco. And I'll leave a link in the description so you can read more about it. But next, the E or external bit is set to one when the originating router is an ASBR. And if you remember, ASBR sits at the border of the OSPF domain and another routing, routing domain. And the B bit or border bit is set to one when the originating router is an ABR. Recall that an ABR is a router that has interfaces in two or more areas and one of those areas is the backbone area. Okay, next we have the number of links field, which specifies the number of router links the LSA describes. 
The router LSA must describe all of the originating router's links or interfaces to the area in which the LSA is flooded. And this is why the router LSA can become quite large depending on the size of the area and how many links the router has in that area. So the following fields in the router LSA describe each link and appear one or more times corresponding to the number of links as specified in the number of links field. So basically this part here is going to repeat for all the different links that the router has. And understanding the link type is important because the description of the link ID and link data fields vary according to the value in the link type field. And this is what I've also described in the OSPF database and LSA header video. And the same table is presented here on the screen again. So let's quickly go over that. So the link type describes the general type of connection the link provides. Uh, type number one is a point-to-point -point connection to another router. And number two is a connection to a transit network. And link type number three is connection to a stub network. And link type number four is a virtual link. Right here. And the link ID identifies the object to which the link connects. And this is dependent on the link type. Note that when connecting to an object that also originates an LSA, that is another router or a transit network, the link ID is the same as the link state ID in the header of the neighboring router's LSA. And this provides the key for looking up the neighboring LSA in the link state database during the routing table calculation. And this value is used to find the neighbor's LSA in the link state database. So in this field, you have different kinds of values depending on the link type. So for link type number one, it's going to be the neighboring router's router ID. For link type, type, for link type two, number two, it's the IP address of the designated router's interface. So note that this is the interface IP address and not the router ID of the designated router. For link type number three, it's the IP network or subnet. And link type number four, it's the neighboring router's router ID. So we've looked at these two fields, link type and link ID. So next, let's look at this one. So the link data also depends on the value of the link type field. And I must admit that this field is a bit of a mystery to me. And I'll read a section directly from the RFC 2328, which defines OSPF version two, that describes the link data field. So for connections to stop networks, link data specifies the network mask. For point-to-point -point connections, it specifies the interface's if index value. I don't know what that is. I'm assuming it's the interface IP address, but that's only my wild guess. For the other link types, it specifies the router interface's IP address. Basically, the last type refers to transit and virtual link types. Um, I think I should have the RFC open here so I can even show it to you. If we scroll down here a little bit, this is in the appendix where you're looking at the router LSA and here it's talking about the link data field. All right, let me jump back to the diagram. So next up, let's move on. We have the number of TOS field, which specifies the number of type of service metrics listed for this link. 
And although TOS is no longer supported in RFC 2328, the TOS fields are still included for backward compatibility with earlier OSPF implementations. If no TOS metrics are associated with a link, this field is set to zero. So basically, this field is really not used anymore. It's just there for backward compatibility. But next here is the metric field. Now this field is important. So it is the cost of the link. And the metric you will see on the routing table is calculated from these values. Uh, we'll not, we will not discuss the OSPF path selection or route calculation more in this video, but just keep that in mind that the metric is car carried in that field. So the next two fields are associated with the link corresponding to the number of TOS field. So this is what we just looked at here. So if the number of TOS is zero, there will be no instances of these fields. And note that Cisco supports only TOS, which is zero. So basically, we don't really have to worry about the TOS fields. Okay, but let's jump to the packet captures now. So I will show you what the router LSA looks like. Um, I actually have two packet captures open here so I can show you the different link types. Again, these are from packetlive.net. I'll leave a link in the description so you can look at this yourself after the video. But here, I have a packet capture called OSPF LSA type. So you can see that there's more than just the router LSA, but we'll obviously focus on LSA type number one in this video. So let me open this up. And as you recall, the, the header is gonna be the same. The only thing to note here is the link state ID, which is the router ID for the router LSA. But then this is the part that we're interested in. So you can see that this router has two links indicated in this field, and then they are listed here. So the first one, which is type Type number three, connection to a stop network. Don't you just love that uh, the packet capture is telling you what that means? So it's not, it's not just showing you three, it's showing you what it actually means. And then in the link ID field, we find the IP network or subnet number. And in the link data field, you have the uh, subnet mask. And here we can verify that the TOS value is zero and the metric is 10. So this was a stub network. Now this one is a transit. So we can see that the fields are slightly different. Here is the IP address of the designated router. Oh, I forgot to point out that this is link type number two. So it's funny that they are listed in this order that, you know, the link type field, which kind, which defines really the other fields is listed third when logically it would make more sense for it to be first. But either way, this is link type number two. And yeah, as I mentioned, this is the IP address of the designated router. And then in the link data field, we have the IP address of the designated router's interface. So these values are going to be equal. All right, let me jump to this other packet capture so I can show you a point to point link. Unfortunately, I did not find a packet capture that would show you the virtual link type, 
but uh, I hope this demonstration is enough for you to understand the different link types. So again, here is a router LSA. And let's scroll down here a little bit. This router has five links. Uh, four of them are stub and here is the point to point link. And again, here's the link type number one point to point connection to another router. And notice here the link ID is the neighboring routers router ID. That's quite interesting, isn't it? And here link data, this was the confusing part from the RFC that said that it is the interfaces if index value. So this is why I guessed that this would be the IP address of the interface on that neighboring router. But I have not verified this information from anywhere. If anyone knows, let uh, type it in the comments and let the rest of us know as well. But yeah, that's really it. Again, number of metrics is zero. I mean, the TOS field is zero and uh, the metric is 64. Okay, that's really it about the packet captures, but there's one more thing that I'd like to show you. And this is why I have another document open here. So the command show IP OSBF database router will list all of the router LSAs in the database. And a single router LSA is observed by specifying the router's router ID. And a complete LSA is recorded in the link state database. So you can see that here, show IP OSB of data, well, it's short for database router 10.0.0.113 right here. Whoops. I did not mean to do that. All right, let me scroll down. I think it was quite far down here. Uh, okay, well, this is a different one, but it doesn't matter. We can look at this one as well. So here's the command. So data is short for database. So one line you will notice in the example and in several subsequent LSAs displays the statement routing bit set on this LSA right here. So the routing bit is not a part of the LSA itself. It is an internal maintenance bit used by the iOS, indicating that the route to the destination advertised by this LSA is valid. So when you see routing bit set on this LSA, it means that the route to this destination is in the routing table. So yeah, basically the routing bit is just an internal flag, which is not stored in an LSA and is not propagated between routers. It's just telling I, the iOS that this route is valid and uh, it can be installed in the routing table. So that's just something to keep in mind. It's not an option bit or one of those VEB bits that you see in the LSA. It's just something specific to the iOS and the internal mechanisms of the router. But yeah, that's really it about the router LSA. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in the next video.